So there is a clear unconscious bias to investing in women. And even in a developed country like the United States, women only get 4 to 7 percent of VC monies. So now if you add to that women who are marginalized, like women of color, rural women or indigenous women, it's even harder for them to get access to capital. So that has to shift. And part of Angels of Impact's work is to flow money to women and indigenous communities and shift that balance of the funding gap. Angels of Impact is a connector that brings together the community-based enterprises, people who have the money, and at the same time the talent and the skills from volunteers and experts who are willing to be able to give their time. Providing funding is not necessarily always enough. Instead, enterprises also need a community of support and learning to support them in any funding that they receive. Hence, we also do customized capacity building. Angels of Impact works with community-based enterprises all across Southeast Asia, as well as in the United States and New Zealand. We fund community-based enterprises, as well as provide them with customized capacity building. One example of the customized capacity building that Angels of Impact provides is the Women Impacting Social Entrepreneurship, or WISE, program. In this program, we bring together skill-based volunteers from around the region, and we pair them with community-based enterprises based on the needs of those enterprises. We seek out women entrepreneurs in the community who are already doing the work. They are whom we call the weavers of society. Many of them are literal weavers, working to preserve the cultures and traditions of their communities. But even for those who work outside of the creative economy space, such as in sustainable agriculture, they too are the metaphorical weavers in the sense that they reinvest profits back into the health of their children or the education of their families, the overall betterment of society. They hold the fabric of society together. The impact of the work that we do at Angels of Impact is multifold. For one, enterprises in our network are plugged into a community of support. For another, they receive new skills and new knowledge, both from the Angels of Impact team as well as from skill-based volunteers. And finally, they have access to funding where they might not otherwise have had that access from which they can grow and scale their work. Angels of Impact has supported Ant Hill and personally me throughout this journey by really being fully present and finding um, so many ways and means to be able to support us in our current challenges. Finance has always been about making money from money. But when you're working with people who are at the community level, really helping their communities, and these are marginalized populations, you need to be looking at money as a source of empowerment. Money is medicine. And in that case, the model is very different. The kind of investor that comes in is very different. The terms you fund has to be restorative. It has to be able to empower people to heal planet and people. So in the next few years, we are actually really going to focus a lot more in the area of the restorative funding, the terms, as well as how we do capacity building. Women have been shown to give back up to 90% of their income to their communities. And when they give back to their communities, their communities do better. That in turn at scale affects the economy of an entire nation. And of course, when the economy of a nation does better, every individual household also benefits. The status quo is what has gotten us into this problem. What we need is new solutions, and the new solutions are on the ground. So I think this is the time for you to change the way you look at the world. Poverty is not here as something that we have to just live with. It is something you can do something about. We can all do something about. So I want to challenge you to think about poverty and how you can play the role in ending poverty. Hello everyone. Welcome to the Impactful Woman Gathering today. I don't know about you, but I loved that video just now, especially the whole term around money as medicine and thinking about how all of us can actually rethink the positioning of poverty and how we use money moving forward. Now, today's event is the culmination event of a year-long incubator under the ASEAN Women Impacting Social Enterprise WISE Fellowship. This program works with women and indigenous peoples driving meaningful change in their communities building capacity for their community-based enterprises addressing poverty in Southeast Asia. 
I'm Atika Amalina, I'm dialing in from Singapore, and I'm honoured to be your MC for this event. Now, did you know that research has shown that nearly 15 million additional people in ASEAN will be pushed into poverty as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? Angels of Impact understands the pertinence of supporting women-led, community-based enterprises for the greater good and to address and rethink the pressing challenges of poverty amidst this pandemic. So I'm really excited for all of us to be relearning this over the course of this two days event and even further longer down the road. Now, before we go further into the program, I understand that some of us may not be entirely familiar with the Hubilo platform. To ensure that we have the best experience over these two days, let me go through several logistical technical announcements. Firstly, please note that there is live interpretation happening throughout the event. You will see a small button at the bottom of the screen that says change language. If you would like to do so, please click on that and select your language of choice. Now, for those of you who may not have the best internet connection as well, you can reduce the video resolution. Just click on the gear icon at the bottom of the video to adjust this. As you, some of you may already know as well, we do have chat moderators from Angels of Impact who will be interacting with you on the chat today. So say hello to them to, on the chat and they will be more than happy to answer any of your questions as we go throughout these two days. For the Hubilo platform itself, some of you also know that you would have been prompted to complete your profiles. Now, I would highly recommend that you complete your profiles so that you, you would be able to fully utilize the matchmaking features. There are also some other pretty cool features, like you can schedule meeting with others, you can share what's on your mind in the event feed, and you can also have some fun mingling in the lounge later on. There is also an exhibitor um, platform as well where you can go and check out and visit and rate the favorite booths, right? So we will be having a People's Choice Award for the best community-based enterprise booth. So please make sure for you, um, to rate your booths as you go along as well. And with all other virtual events, I understand the distractions that's happening from your emails, from your children, from anything else. So I would encourage you to be fully present with us today and try to minimize all of these other distractions. Now, with that, I'm really excited to kick off the Impactful Woman 2021. Together, I'm really hopeful that we'll be able to learn how to strengthen these community-based enterprises as we work together to overcome the downsides of this pandemic and help end poverty in the lives of many. So with that, it's now time to invite our guest of honour, Dr. Vivian Balakrishnan, the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Singapore, to give his welcome address. Dr. Vivian, please. His Excellency, Charles Thomas Peterson, Ambassador of the Kingdom of Norway to ASEAN, Ibu Lenny Rosalind, Deputy Minister for Gender Equality at the Ministry of Women's Empowerment and Child Protection of Indonesia, and Chair of the ASEAN Committee on Women. Distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, I would first like to congratulate the 17 women entrepreneurs from this year's ASEAN Women Impacting Social Entrepreneurship, or WISE Fellowship for your remarkable efforts in uplifting the lives of many other women in your communities. Today marks the culmination of the year-long fellowship to support our women entrepreneurs. And it is an opportune moment for us to celebrate the power that women have to embark on their own paths of their own choosing and to play an active role to contribute fully to our community. Angels of Impact has played a critical role in implementing the ASEAN WISE project to elevate and to include women and women-led social enterprises across ASEAN as key solutions towards a more equitable and sustainable world. In particular, I applaud the progress made through this initiative towards achieving the three UN Sustainable Development Goals of eliminating poverty, of achieving gender equality, as well as responsible consumption and production. I'm very happy to see the cross-border public-private partnership across the Angels of Impact and SAP in Singapore, the ASEAN Secretariat, the ASEAN Foundation, and the Royal Norwegian Embassy in Indonesia, as well as AirAsia Foundation in Malaysia. We should continue to encourage more of this public-private collaboration to enable women-led enterprises to contribute and to reinvest in their communities. 
When the ASEAN leaders charted a vision for the 2025 ASEAN community back in 2015, they reaffirmed our collective will to build a resilient, inclusive, people-oriented and people-centred community that engenders equitable development and inclusive growth. In line with this vision, ASEAN's WISE work demonstrates how much can be achieved when we connect, support and empower our women entrepreneurs in meaningful ways. Business gains are not merely confined to the enterprise itself, but really are shared amongst employees, their families and communities. And this has amplified the contributions of women-led enterprises across the entire Southeast Asia. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has dealt a blow to our enterprises, including those under the ASEAN WISE program. I know that many of you have faced challenges, such as revenues being reduced sometimes by between 50 to 75% or even more, while struggling to accommodate working mothers and the transition to digital sales channels. Amid such difficult times, it is all the more important to create a supportive environment that enables community-based enterprises to prosper. As outlined in the ASEAN Social Cultural Community Blueprint, we must establish a culture that accommodates the needs of youth, of persons with disabilities, and of course, women. On Singapore's part, we've conducted a year-long Conversations on Singapore Women's Development Series. This has involved more than 160 sessions with nearly 6,000 participants. They included both men and women from all walks of life who shared their aspirations on how society can establish stronger partnerships to support our women in achieving their personal, career and family aspirations to make Singapore more resilient and a better home for all of us. Proposals to enhance the support given to women at home, in schools, in the workplace and the community will be presented to our parliament in a white paper on Singapore Women's Development early next year. The Singapore government has and will continue to partner our community partners and companies to advance Singapore women's development. We also look forward to sharing best practices with our fellow ASEAN member states. I'm confident that ASEAN WISE and its fellows will continue your good work to inspire and to serve our respective communities and to make ASEAN an even more united and cohesive entity. The ASEAN WISE fellows have much to be proud of, but your journey is not over yet. Women must have the power to choose the path that gives them the most fulfillment and the power to contribute most effectively to all our societies. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Vivian, for that wonderful address and for acknowledging how tough the past couple of years during the pandemic has been. And really, I also agree that the WISE Fellows um, have so much to be proud of and um, we look forward to much growth and inspiration moving forward. I would now like to invite Ambassador Chow Tormut Peterson, the Ambassador to ASEAN from the Royal Norwegian Embassy, to give his opening remarks as well. Ambassador, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think, uh, okay, there it is, okay. Your Excellency, Dr. Balakishman, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Singapore, Evie Rusali, Chair of ASEAN Committee on Women, uh, Dr. Yang, Executive Director for the ASEAN Foundation, distinguished participants. Please let me start by thanking you for the opportunity to welcome you all to this event. I would like to express my gratitude to Angela Impact for this initiative and to the ASEAN Committee on Women for its endorsement and support. An important goal in Norway's foreign policy is to ensure that all women and men have equal rights. We strive to empower and to enable women's participation in working life. With Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals, the international community has agreed on what kind of future we want. It's a development agenda, but it is also, at its heart, a human rights agenda. The central premise of the SDGs is leaving no one behind. We believe it's vital for both political and economic development. The work of Angela's impact at today's event can be directly linked to several other 16 SDGs, 
but in particular, number one, no poverty, number five, gender equality, and number 12, responsible consumption and production. Women's economic and political participation is fundamental to economic growth and peaceful societies. If we neglect the fact, our societies will only prosper at half capacity. Norway is committed to a, to a sustainable future, to achieve the targets in the Paris Agreement to reduce carbon emissions in order to reach the 1.5 degree temperature goal, we need creative business thinking benefiting everyone, not only the rich. The advice program is evidence of such a creative economy, bringing together enterprises, skill-based volunteers, and educated funders to build capacity. We attach great importance to regional dimensions in our cooperation with ASEAN, and we commend national impact for including enterprises from almost all ASEAN countries. We recognize the efforts ANSEL impact has made in supporting community-based businesses and decisions offering coping with the present pandemic. I'm confident that ASEAN Vice Fellowship Program, which marks its culmination by this event, has supported the goal of increasing access of women entrepreneurs, including young women with finance, credit, markets, skill training, technology, and social protection. I'm glad that our support helps to enable to create viable women-led businesses and to influence social change. Finally, I wish you all the best with the program for this event today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Chow, for that address. You know, thank you for also acknowledging all of the work that's being done by Angels of Impact as well as all of these other fellows. Um, and we will go on further to really fulfill the SDGs as well. Next, it is now my pleasure to introduce Ibu Leni Rosalind, the Chair of ASEAN Committee of Women, to provide her opening remarks. Ibu Leni, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, His Excellency, uh, Dr. Fifian uh, Balakrishnan, Minister for Foreign Affairs, Singapore. His Excellency, Mr. Kiel Patterson, Ambassador of the Kingdom of Norway to ASEAN. Dr. Yang Mi Eng, Executive Director of the ASEAN Foundation. Ms. Laina Green, Founder and CEO of Angels of Impact representatives from the ASEAN Committee on Women, or SCW, the Asian Coordinating Committee on Micro, Small, and Medium Enterprises, SCCMSME, and the ASEAN Women Entrepreneurs Network, or AWEN. Social Enterprises of the WISE Fellowship Program, Honorable Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen. Good afternoon from Jakarta, Indonesia. I'm honored to welcome you all to this event, the Women Impacting Social Entrepreneurship or WISE project has arrived at a timely manner as ASEAN reaffirms its commitment to achieve gender equality and empowerment of women, particularly amidst the challenges brought about the, by the COVID-19 pandemic. SEW, as the sponsoring ASEAN body of the project, acknowledges the importance of uplifting women-led social enterprises. Doing so directly contributes to achieving SDGs 1 on reducing poverty and SDGs 5 on achieving gender equality and women empowerment, especially in the ASEAN region. This is in line with the project's goal to prepare social enterprises to be funding ready, to get them funded and connect them with partners for market access so they can confidently absorb capital. Women-led social enterprises face difficulties in assessing and securing capital and funding support. This is due to a lack of interest from banks and impact investors to finance sustainable efforts on poverty eradication and gender equality. Often called the missing needle, women-led social enterprises are key agents to achieve the sustainable development goals. The ASEAN Leaders Special Session 
at the 36th ASEAN Summit on Women's Empowerment in the Digital Age held in June last year, underscored the importance of enhancing the welfare and, the, and development of all women and children in ASEAN, improving access and responding to challenges as a result of rapid development of ICT. Further, the leaders agreed that addressing gender inequality and preventing and combating violence against women are essential to responding to and recovering from the pandemic. Relatedly, the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery Framework served as a consolidated strategy for ASEAN to emerge more resilient and stronger from the COVID-19 crisis, giving due consideration to the hardest hit sectors and vulnerable groups. The framework focused on five broad strategies, namely enhancing the health system, strengthening human security, maximizing the potential of intra-ASEAN market and broader economic integration, accelerating inclusive digital transformation, and advancing towards a more sustainable and resilient future. Ladies and gentlemen, ASEAN Committee on Women continues its effort to promote the achievement of the SDGs. In March 2021, this year, SCW with support from UN Women and the ASEAN Secretariat has launched the ASEAN Gender Outlook, achieving the SDGs for all and leaving no woman or girl behind. The Gender Outlook is a milestone report that looks at the gains, gaps, and challenges in achieving the SDGs in ASEAN countries against the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic by using a gender lens. SCW has just concluded the fourth ASEAN ministerial meeting on women and related meetings in October this year and was guided by the theme digital economy and financial inclusion for improving ASEAN women's competitiveness. During the meeting, the ministers agreed to accelerate efforts that include women in the digital economy, financial inclusion, and asset ownership. These efforts include improving accessibility and affordability of financial products and services, promoting interoperability among financial institutions, strengthening connectivity and streamlining financial support, disseminating information on e-commerce, digital platforms, and financial technology, conducting capacity building or trainings, coaching and mentoring, and enhancing market opportunities and linkages. The recently launched ASEAN UN SCAP joint report on addressing unpaid care work in ASEAN underscored the need to address the root causes of unequal distribution of care and domestic work, as these are deeply entrenched gender norms and stereotypes that require collective action. Further, the report identified priority actions related to women's economic empowerment that may be undertaken by ASEAN countries, UNSCAP, and development partners in 2021 and beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, in forging ahead as a more resilient ASEAN community, the ASEAN Committee on Women, or SCW, together with key partners, stakeholders, and the ASEAN Secretariat is making sure that the efforts in advancing gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls remain at the core of ASEAN recovery efforts during and beyond the COVID. 19 pandemic. In closing, I would like to express my gratitude to the government of Norway, ASEAN Foundation, Angels of Impact, and the ASEAN Secretariat for very good collaboration and support to implement the WISE Fellowship Program 2021 and its final event today. I look forward to a fruitful and productive discussion with everyone. With this, 
I conclude my remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ibuleni. I really appreciate that insightful address, especially in terms of ensuring that we have a gendered lens um, in terms of our resilience and recovery out of this pandemic and making sure that we're including women and girls and making sure that no one is left behind. So thank you so much for calling that out. Um, I'm sure we really appreciate it together with all of the other um, fellows as well. Now, last but certainly not least, I am very happy to call to the stage Ms. Laina Green, the CEO of Angels of Impact, to give us her welcome address. Laina, please. Welcome, everyone, to Impactful Women. My name is Laina Ravindran Green, and I'm the CEO and founder of Angels of Impact. Angels of Impact is an organization that funds and supports women and Indigenous-led community-based enterprises doing the hard work of alleviating poverty, bringing about gender equality, doing it through responsible and sustainable businesses. We work with empowered women who empower other women. They do this by aggregating their work and creating more value, thereby more effectively taking their communities out of systemic poverty. We call them community-based enterprises and not just social enterprises, as these are enterprises that are deeply entrenched in their community, have their best interests at heart, and share wealth in a way thereby creating a lasting impact to get them out of poverty. Yet these are women enterprises are usually undervalued, underestimated, and underfunded. We at Angels of Impact seek to change this as we see these women as weavers of the fabric of a resilient community. It is their hard work that inspires us, the volunteers and people in our network to offer our time, resources and networks to amplify their work. We live today in a very divided world challenged by climate chaos and inequity. We really cannot have more of the same. We need a new way of doing things. We believe that we need to fund the people doing the work on the ground, the ones creating new systems and therefore needing different forms of funding. We do need new forms of funding where we can use money as medicine, as Edgar Villanueva, who wrote the book, Decolonizing Wealth, spoke about. Or to use money to shift power and wealth back into marginalized communities that heal people and planet. So says Namaka Akbo, who runs a $450 million Katali fund and founded the term restorative economics. Humanity needs a more interconnected, non-extractive and complex system based on human understanding, compassion, healing, collaboration and unity for a better world. Marginalized women and indigenous communities are actually the key to lead us back into a less extractive and more compassionate world. They are the keys to building a better world in which if only we would listen and shift wealth and power back to them. Angels of Impact aims to amplify their work through a more non-extractive entrepreneur-friendly funding structure and technical assistance. We believe that we need to work together in partnership to shift wealth and power where it matters. People and planet should go hand in hand. We are truly grateful to receive such high level support at this event for the community-based enterprises and the work they do, especially given the hard times we are currently in. We are also very deeply grateful to all the distinguished speakers who've spoken and will speak over the next two days and gratitude to Norway for supporting this project for ASEAN Foundation for partnering with us, for ASEAN Committee on Women for endorsing this project, and to all our corporate partners, volunteers, and enterprises that have stepped up to make this project a success. This project has many achievements over the year. Some of the enterprises have told us that it's helped them survive this pandemic. Being part of this program, they have gained extra hands to get work done extra money from the COVID relief fund to help ease the pain of running their enterprises. Being in community with others have helped them learn and not feel alone. And getting help to get connected digitally, which they were forced to do during the pandemic. 
including opening new sales channels. These are just some of the wins that we have seen in this program. I hope you will get a sense of how deep the relationships that have been built and how deep the impact of the work of these women-led community-based enterprises are all doing with such dedication and love. We hope also over the next two days, you will feel inspired as to how you can make a difference to help end poverty in this world, especially through community-based enterprises. Let us together amplify their work and together create a better world for all. Open your hearts and listen. Take time to learn. This is the time to see how we can all show up differently in the world together. Thank you once again and welcome. Wow, I don't know about you, but I was blown away by that speech. Uh, thank you so much for the inspiring message. Personally, I'm a diversity, equity and inclusion practitioner and I work in a big tech company. So when they actually uh, approached me to do this event, I was personally very inspired just by the fellows and we're going to be actually getting to know them throughout these two days. Uh, and the message around making sure that we're rethinking the ways that we're approaching poverty, that we're approaching actually achieving the sustainable development goals is such a core part of this fellowship. Uh, and, and together with you, I am as much learning on this journey uh, and I am very, very excited to actually go on to this next section where we will get to meet the fellows themselves. So as was mentioned earlier, the 2021 WISE Fellowship Cohort consists of 17 community-based enterprises in the creative economy and span nine ASEAN countries. Now these fellows aggregate impact by helping other women earn an income and they in turn reinvest their earnings back into their communities. We will be getting to know a lot more about them across these two days. And first off, I am more than happy to begin with a presentation by Ant Hill Fabric Gallery. I firsthand witnessed the death of a weaving culture. My mom took us to visit this community up north in the Philippines, and we had a very thriving community, and everyone was just very proud of their craft. There was basket weaving, there was fabric weaving, there was wood carving. And then a few years after, we came back and visited the community and it was a ghost town, like a total ghost town. And that, I feel like, triggered a social pain in me also. Hi, I'm Anya Lim. I am the co-founder, managing, and creative director of Ant Hill Fabric Gallery. Ant Hill Fabric Gallery is a social and a cultural enterprise that works to provide sustainable livelihood to our partner weaving artisans across the Philippines. We do this by applying our weaves in contemporary and circular design as well as providing capacity building to our partner artisans. When we started Ant Hill about a decade ago, there's a huge threat in the weaving industry and that was really our core mission is to preserve our weaving culture. And it still is very important for us. However, as we evolved, we focused more on the value of sustaining the livelihood of these artisans and these weavers. Ant Hill creates impact in various ways. One is by providing market access. We felt that the way for us to be able to sustain livelihood and the way for us to be able to constantly instill pride among our artisans is to take our weaves to the world. And the way to do that is to launch a website, to really become like a multi-vendor marketplace where the artisans are able to directly access this platform so they can sell their fabrics and their products direct to the consumer. We also invest so much in the capacity building through our community enterprise development programs. We've actually invested in our community to learn how to weave upcycled fabrics or what we call our zero waste weave. So we constantly try to find ways to innovate the weaving techniques to adapt to the changing times. We teach them how to do basic accounting, so we ensure that they're also profitable in their business. So 
they're able to manage their finances better. And so now because of this program, they're able to have other investments and other revenue channels apart from just weaving. Pablo ni Loriana is almost four years na nga partner sa Antil. Ang Antil nag-support siya sa paghatag o mga materialis. O oh, naghatag mga materialis para mahimo nga uh, mahabi diri mahimo fabric. Mm, nga na siya unya dili pud kay kuandra financially support kanang sa kuan pud kanang mga mura bitag isip pamilya na bitaw ma'am nga na pud ka supportive ang auntie. Mm -mm. Importante gid ni siya nga atong i-preserve kay kanang Usa mga good ni sab sa mga sources sa mga atuang kaniadto nga mga katigulangan or mga ninuno bitaw. O usa ni siya nga sources. So sayang kun dili i-preserve ma'am kay dako man gyud siya og ikatabang sa komunidad. It's very important understanding the value of what goes behind weaving, how this relates to our identity as a people. Hi, Anya. Thank you for joining us today. So excited. Um, so I know that you have been working with a community of artisans. Now, I'm sure together with the rest of the people who's joining us today, how and in what ways can we support uh, the, your community of artisans? What kind of support do you need most in 2022? Thank you so much for your question, Atika. Um, indeed, we need so much support right now. Anthill has been badly affected by the pandemic, and this has had a ripple effect to our artisans. What really limited us was um, creating impact and continuing running our capacity building program to our partner communities, given the limitation of travel. So the support we really need is through funding and grants that will allow us to digitalize our community enterprise development program and translate this into an artisan business care toolkit or what we call the ABC toolkit. So we can run online classes for our artisans to gain skills, how to be tech savvy and adapt to the changing times, weave tradition and technology so they can access more markets online and be globally competitive. We also would hope that we can partner with uh, long-term long collaborations and a lot of businesses that could support us through social procurement so we can liquidate our overstock of inventory and reinvest our profits back to running our programs. That's it for us. Thank you so much. And we are looking forward to your support. All right. Thank you so much for sharing that insight with us. I'm sure we'll be able to learn more about this at your booths as well as all the other booths that we have today. So thank you. Up next, we have Perkumpulan Lawe. Lawe adalah sebuah community social enterprise yang bergerak di bidang pengembangan tenun tradisional Indonesia melalui pemberdayaan perempuan. Lawe berdiri tahun 2004 karena adanya keprihatinan bahwa kain tradisional Indonesia yang ada dari ujung barat sampai ujung timur Indonesia dan sangat beragam dan cantik tapi belum bisa bicara langsung ke pasar. Lawe mengembangkan produk dengan menggunakan kain tradisional Indonesia, terutama tenun, dan lebih spesifik lagi kebanyakan yang kami uh, develop adalah nurik dari Jogja. Kain-kain ini kami kembangkan menjadi produk-produk seperti tas, pouch, dompet, home decor, soft toys, dan juga kami bisa memenuhi permintaan baik personal order dalam jumlah kecil maupun company merchandising dalam jumlah yang besar. Lawe bekerja sama dengan penenun, kemudian kain tenun ini kami bawa ke workshop untuk dipotong sesuai pola dan desain, kemudian kami antar ke penjahit karena sebagian besar penjahit lawe bekerja di rumah, kemudian setelah selesai kita bawa kembali ke workshop untuk melalui proses QC dan kami pack untuk kemudian kami kirim ke konsumen. Sisa-sisa kain dari produksi kami olah lagi menjadi produk yang lebih kecil berupa kitchen, kandungan kunci, juga berupa pensil untuk kelopaknya, 
dan juga untuk produk-produk boneka lainnya. Sedangkan sisa kain terkecil kami gunakan untuk mengenalkan kain lurik untuk anak-anak di TK dan SD di program kami yang namanya Craft Class. Dalam pengembangan desain, Lawe mengusung emphatical design. Kami menyesuaikan skill pengrajin kami dengan tidak memaksakan keterampilan yang mereka punya. Jadi ketika kami memiliki desain dan kami coba bikin sampel ke penjahit in-house kami, apabila mereka menemui kesulitan, kami akan coba sederhanakan. Secara desain, produk-produknya Lawe itu lebih generik dan sederhana karena memang pada dasarnya tidak ada keterampilan yang kami paksakan di pengrajin kami. Untuk pemasaran, Lawe melakukan pemasaran melalui beberapa cara, baik offline, kami ada showroom di Galeri Amri, juga ada workshop di daerah Kerapya, teman-teman bisa datang langsung ke sini. Untuk online, kami ada website www.laweindonesia.com, juga di sosial media, baik Facebook maupun Instagram, tapi juga ada di beberapa marketplace uh, di Indonesia. Untuk pameran, Lawe secara beruntun sejak tahun 2007, kami mengikuti Inacraft di Jakarta, sebuah pameran kerajinan terbesar di Indonesia. Juga Lawe beberapa kali mengikuti pameran di luar negeri seperti uh, Lifestyle Vietnam dan juga Maison Eobze di Paris. Untuk karyawan eh, yang ada di Lawe, sebagian dari kami bekerja di workshop dan lebih banyak lagi pengrajin yang bekerja home base, mereka mengerjakan jahitannya di rumah. Dan Lawe juga memiliki sekitar tujuh pengrajin difabel, dua bisu tuli dan lima eh, pengrajin cacat fisik, mereka adalah survivor gempa Jogja 2005. Harapan kami ke depan, Lawe bisa menjadi penyedia berbagai produk berkualitas tinggi, berbahan kain tradisional Indonesia, dan juga menjadi pusat belajar untuk pengembangan kain tradisional Indonesia. Hi, India. Thank you so much for joining us for today. You know, like all of us are really hoping for the pandemic to be ending soon and we're seeing the end of the tunnel. Uh, do you have any exciting plans for the future? Hello, Atika. Thank you for this great opportunity. I'm so excited to share Lawi's goal, how we think we can upscale our social business. So with the help of WISE Asian program, uh, first of all, I want to give thanks to our marvelous mentor, Vicky, that helps us build Lawe strategy especially. And I also like to thank Pavitra, who helped Lawe organize its financial report. And I want to send our hugs and kisses to all of Angels of Impact's volunteers, especially to Safira and also Manka and also for Medi and Lina too. So for the long term, we plan to double company size revenue on 2026. And then we want to establish a Lawe Learning Center on 2024. And for the next year, we want to execute a business strategy, including seven goals strategic objective in 2022. And that clustered in three elements, which are marketing and growth, uh, community development, and then the third uh, is operational excellence. So let me share a bit about uh, these seven goals. So for marketing and growth, we set four goals, which are first is uh, digital marketing uh, for our B2C channel. 
So our plan is to improve our online marketing channel for direct customers, including to big marketplaces in Indonesia. And then we like to optimize our social media. Uh, we have website, uh, Google My Business, Instagram, and Facebook page. And then the second goal uh, is B2B growth strategy. So we will pursue for especially bulk order from companies and national institutions. So right now we work closely to Bank of Indonesia, and we also want to expand our collaboration with Indonesian embassies uh, throughout the world. So the third goal is to build next generation catalog. So actually it's to create a next generation catalog with fewer SKUs and larger MOQ, because now our products range is too wide. And we need the investment required for market research to identify the most relevant products for market and the catalog creation itself. Then the fourth goal is Alawi Heritage. We plan to design and launch our luxury product line called Lawe Heritage. So it will customize uh, marketing strategy and uh, with influencers and bespoke channels. And uh, then we have two specific goals, uh, two specific goals for community development and conserve tradition uh, cluster that are uh, goals number five, uh, we want to make weaving attractive to younger generations. So we will provide a lot of trainings for younger generations and we want to ask them to involve in uh, some events of it. And then the sixth one is to uh, 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 on sisterhood of love expansion. Uh, we create this program to other women to build their own label and love will support uh, the design process and production support system. And the seven goals, our last goals, we want to improve our operational excellence. So with all of this effort, we, we are looking forward to pursue love's next journey. Well, thank you so much. That is such a hopeful way to take a look at the future. I'm really excited for your plans. Good luck, uh, and we'll check you out uh, at the booth later. Thank you. Next, we have Tosang Cotton Village. Tosang literally means weaving light. So weaving with light. Swadikha, my name is Priya Yipersert, and I'm the founder of Tosang Cotton Village. Tossang Cotton Village is an ethical textile studio where we start all the way from growing the cotton itself, transforming the raw materials with hand and the use of technology, and finishing by hand weaving into metered fabric. So there are emergent problems within the fashion industry, such as the lack of transparency and the ethics that go into making the clothes that we wear every day. One of the goals of Tossang Cotton Village is to be transparent about where our products come from we enable villagers to price their products properly, which means avoiding the undercutting and predatory pricing of the Thai textile industry and encouraging fair wages by including labor costs, transparency throughout the entire process, and verifiable traceability. By giving importance to where it is grown and those involved with the entire process of making the product, we bring values to the products so that the customers can really be in touch with their products and have a connection with the makers. จะให้เค้ารู้สึกว่าโอ้เค้าได้อนุรักษ์ความเป็นธรรมชาติแล้วก็ดั้งเดิมตั้งแต่สมัยบรรพบุรุษว่าโอ้เค้าทํากันมา
With this, Tossan Cotton Village aims to build a community committed to sustainable practices, and we hope to inspire others to join us on this path. Kapun ka. Hi Prairie, it's so good to see you. I've been meaning to ask you this particular question. So what do you really believe to be so special and so unique about your brand? Hi, well thank you first for um, having me on stage. Um, what I believe for our brand to be special um, and what makes us unique is the fact that we're located where everything happens throughout the production chain. So we're right next to the Mekong River and our, our locals that we work with grow the cotton um, next to the Mekong River with its rich fertile soil. And then we do everything on location, um, whether that is ginning, spinning, dyeing, weaving, and then making it into finished products. And it's all connected within our local community here. Um, so with that process, it's very sustainable and it's very transparent. And um, the customers that you know buy our products or engage with our services, whether that be buying our raw materials, buying our needed fabric, or buying the products that we um, make into them, or using our services such as um, our design services where we can connect um, designers with our weavers and basically bridge that gap um, between um, you know production and the community. Um, and or you know buying little trinkets such as keychains or clothing and stuff like that, that kind of stuff um, really envelops the location. We really try to put um, the story of our location and our community and our transparency into the products that our customers get as well. Great, thank you so much. It's like when I have one of your products, I'm by the Mekong River as well. So thank you so much. I'll catch you soon. Thank you. All right, now I'm excited to have Traditional Arts and Ethnology Center. Laos is one of the most ethnically diverse countries in Southeast Asia, something that not a lot of people know. The country is made up of only about 7 million people, and actually the Thai Lao people, which are the majority population of the country, only make up just over 50% of the population. So almost half of the population is a number of different ethnic minority groups. My name is Tara Gujadar. I'm the co-founder and co-director of the Traditional Arts and Ethnology Center. TAC is a cultural heritage social enterprise based in the World Heritage Site of Lom Bang in Northern Laos. It was started in 2007 by myself and my co-director, Tong Khun Sutivilai, to promote more understanding of the cultural diversity of Laos in a few different ways. We have exhibitions in a museum. We also run handicrafts programs and we sell these uh, products through our two brick and mortar stores and online. And we also do research, we have a collection, we do education and outreach programs in local schools. Currently, we work with a number of different communities all over the country, and our handicrafts program actually works with 33 villages in 13 provinces with over 600 artisans, primarily ethnic minority women who are the poorest population of the country. We help them create the production of the products, the pricing of it, transporting it to the market, getting the payments, setting up a bank account, making sure everybody's got phones and WhatsApp, etc. So um, it's really an organic process. We made the decision early on that we wanted to be a social enterprise, so we have a social mission, but we wanted to operate on business principles. 50% of the income from our shops goes directly back to our artisans. We're really proud of uh, what TAC has been able to contribute to these communities and partner with them, both from the income that they've generated in the communities and also the overall pride and celebration that people have in cultural diversity in Laos, that people are now appreciating the value of their cultural heritage and who they are. 
we really want TAC to be a place of celebration of identity and diversity and for both people from Laos and visitors to really appreciate all of the cultural resources that Laos has to offer. Knowing where you've come from is an important part of mapping where you're going. And here in Laos, we're in this time of rapid development, rapid modernization. And so it's an opportunity for us to help people think about what is it that I want and what is the parts of the culture that I want to hold on to. Hi Tara, welcome. So glad to have you here with us. So I have a question for you. So why did you choose handicrafts and culture as the focus of your business mission? Well, Atika, handicrafts are a great opportunity for both livelihoods development for rural ethnic minorities as well as for cultural preservation. Handicrafts are based on traditional skills that are held by women as well as ethnic minorities. Um, and in Laos here, rural ethnic minority women are the poorest population in the country. So it's really an important income source. Uh, handicrafts can be made at home in tandem with other livelihood strategies, such as farming or household tasks, taking care of children. Um, they can generally be adapted and innovated to suit different um, market segments. So, you know, handicrafts are traditionally made for personal use or within the community, but they can be adapted for bags or for shirts and things for tourists and others. Um, and, and this investment can really help to keep the craft um, and the cultural traditions and the skills to produce these crafts alive. Um, so it really encourages interest and appreciation um, among a wider audience such as youth. Um, and finally, they can really be, they can be indefinitely stored, um, unlike agricultural products. Mm -hmm. um, and so, of course, during COVID, we've had a lot of storage necessary. Um, and they can be shipped and handled relatively inexpensively. So all around, I think they're a great opportunity for rural communities who want to participate in trade or tourism, but don't have the language skills or resources or geog geog geographical location to make that happen. Great. Well, that's such a thoughtful way of approaching that. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you. And last and very certainly not least, we have Chie Crafts and Design. Còn cụm từ đằng sau Zupu Zupa là một cụm từ trong tiếng Thái. Nó có nghĩa là ở rừng, ở núi. Mọi đồ vật, mọi sản phẩm, mọi đồ đạc ở Chie thì đều mang hơi thở của rừng núi, mang bản sắc của người dân tộc thiểu số vùng cao mà tôi muốn giới thiệu đến khách hàng ở khắp nơi. Hello, xin chào các bạn. À, tôi là Trương Thủy, à, tôi là founder của uh, Chie. À, tôi bắt đầu Chie từ tháng 8 năm 2011. Chie bán và giới thiệu các sản phẩm được dệt và may thủ công, được làm bởi những người dân tộc thiểu số ở miền núi. Chie trưng bày và giới thiệu các sản phẩm liên quan đến văn hóa của người dân tộc thiểu số. Cái khó khăn khi mà làm việc với những người phụ nữ đó là họ hay bị các quan niệm, định kiến hoặc phong tục tập quán có cái sự đối xử không công bằng đối với phụ nữ ở trong cộng đồng dân tộc của họ. Ví dụ như là người hơ mông là những người phụ nữ thì ít được coi trọng cho đến bây giờ ở một số nơi người phụ nữ vẫn phải ăn cơm sau hoặc phải phục tùng người đàn ông ở trong nhà và tiếng nói của họ ít được coi trọng Thế nhưng sau một thời gian khi mà họ có một công việc ổn định có thu nhập thì đồng thời họ cũng tự tin hơn và tiếng nói của họ cũng sẽ có trọng lượng hơn Chúng tôi đã làm việc cùng với bà con người dân tộc Thái ở Mai Châu, Hòa Bình, Sơn La, người dân tộc Lào ở Điện Biên, người dân tộc Mông ở Hà Giang, người dân tộc Mông ở Nghệ An và ở Bà Cò, Hòa Bình và một số nhóm bà con thuộc các dân tộc ở Tây Nguyên, miền Trung của Việt Nam. Cái cách mà Chia làm việc với bà con đó là chúng tôi luôn luôn 
nhấn mạnh về cái 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 việc là chúng tôi trao quyền chủ động cho bà con chúng tôi làm nhiều những khóa đào tạo tùy theo nhu cầu của bà con và khả năng của chúng tôi ví dụ như là đào tạo may đào tạo theo các tập huấn phối màu tập huấn quản lý sản xuất và hỗ trợ bà con trong việc đi hỗ trợ kết nối với khách hàng tức là toàn bộ cái quá trình từ tấm vải dệt ra đến những sản phẩm có diện giá trị cao thì bà con hoàn toàn có thể chủ động làm và người ta nhận được cái giá trị lớn hơn, cái tiền công lớn hơn. Có một niềm tin là uh, cái nghề thủ công này, những cái mà nó thuộc về văn hóa, những cái mà nó mang cái giá trị truyền thống thì nó sẽ có một cái sức mạnh, có một cái sức sống mãnh liệt và bằng một cách nào đó thì nó sẽ sẽ tồn tại. Nên là tôi lại cố gắng và tiếp tục mỗi sự quan tâm của các bạn đối với chia đối với các sản phẩm được dệt may thủ công và mang màu sắc văn hóa của những người phụ nữ dân tộc thiểu số vùng cao ở Việt Nam thì nó không chỉ là sự quan tâm đối với chúng tôi riêng chúng tôi mà nó là sự quan tâm sự ủng hộ sự động viên rất là lớn đối với cả một cộng đồng những cái người phụ nữ Hi, Team Chie. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm also really excited to know, you know, what plans do you have for 2022? And how can we also support you through that? Hello, xin chào. À, tôi là Thủy. Tôi đến từ doanh nghiệp xã hội Chie Dù Bù Dù Bà. Um, cảm ơn các bạn ngày hôm nay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Thuy, and I'm the founder of Chie Zupu Zupa Social Enterprise in Vietnam. Thank you very much for your joining today. Tôi rất vui được chia sẻ về um, kế hoạch 6 tháng tới của Chie. And I'm very glad to share with you about the Chie plan in the next six months in 2022. Đầu tiên là chúng tôi sẽ tập trung vào việc... Uh, nghiên cứu thị trường, tìm hiểu về nhu cầu của khách hàng uh, theo hai thị trường mà chúng tôi muốn hướng đến đó là thị trường uh, bán lẻ trong nước um, và thị trường xuất khẩu bao gồm cả các kênh thương mại điện tử. Um, and uh, our plan in the next year will be focusing on uh, market research and uh, the analysis of the customer needs uh, for both domestic and the foreign uh, for, foreign market. And uh, we really want to uh, know more and uh, do the research on both the e-commerce and the kinds of the online selling, then we could have the clear strategies in the next year. Kế hoạch thứ hai là chúng tôi sẽ tập trung vào sản phẩm À, chúng tôi sẽ tìm nhiều cách để cải tiến sản phẩm, à, bao gồm cả phần thiết kế à, từ à, từ sản phẩm cho đến hình ảnh à, và chúng tôi tìm hiểu à, nghiên cứu về cải tiến máy móc à, những cái công nghệ để phục vụ cho việc làm sợi của bà con được tốt hơn. Ví dụ hiện tại chúng tôi đang nghiên cứu phát triển một số các cái loại sợi thực vật khác ngoài những cái sợi phổ biến của bà con như là cốt tông hay gai dầu ra thì chúng tôi đang tìm hiểu thêm, chúng tôi đang làm thử thêm về sợi chuối, sợi từ cây cây lưỡi hổ và một số loại cây khác và chúng tôi đang nghiên cứu cái máy nối sợi để cho cái việc làm sợi thủ công của bà con được tốt hơn. And basing on the research that we have done so far, we will uh, improve the GA product quality. It's not only related to the GA design, but also the quality of the fabric that we use to make the final products. We are currently working and um, do some kinds of the um, experiment to 
complete the splicing machine and the, the machine will be used for improving the uh, quality of the thread uh, that uh, the ending minority group uh, currently uh, produce and we believe that uh, through this guys of the technique we could uh, provide we could uh, we could provide the uh, great support to the to the ethnic community to produce a high quality of the thread and we also uh, have some idea and uh, some experiment to uh, make the organic thread from other plants, not only from hemp, not only from cotton, uh, these guys of the very typical thing from ethnic groups, but also from other kinds of the plants. And we will have the plan to um, support the ethnic minority group to produce the same thing. And we think that it will be too early that we will pay attention in the next year. And kế hoạch gần nhất mà chúng tôi đang làm đấy là thiết kế lại toàn bộ các cái phần nhận diện của thương hiệu. Uh, the most currently thing that we have done uh, related to the brand positioning and we think that it will create kind of a very clear image of the GA to all the customer uh, that we want to target to. And uh, yeah, and this is also the thing that we currently have done. Yeah. À, tôi rất uh, vui vì được tham gia vào dự án à, tôi rất uh, cảm ơn sự hỗ trợ nhiệt tình của các bạn à, à, sau khi mà dự án kết thúc thì tôi uh, cũng vẫn mong muốn là um, có thể tìm kiếm được sự uh, hỗ trợ từ phía các bạn ví dụ như là uh, tư vấn về uh, chiến lược phát triển thương hiệu uh, hoặc là hỗ trợ chúng tôi uh, có thể tiếp cận nguồn uh, vốn uh, sau một thời gian tới khi mà chúng tôi uh, cải tiến mọi thứ được tốt hơn từ cái sự tư vấn của các bạn uh, sự hỗ trợ của các bạn trong cái quá trình tham gia dự án vừa rồi xin cảm ơn We feel very lucky to have opportunity to join the fellowship program uh, provided uh, NGO impact teams because thanks to that we have quite many chances uh, that we could apply into our business and we believe and hope that in the next coming months we still could accompany with you guys and still could receive the support and assistance from you, especially kinds of the technical assistance, um, because we really want to get our support to develop the long-term uh, business and marketing strategy as well as uh, we need you to support it, uh, to connect with the um, kinds of the fund or the investment. Then in the next stage of GA development, we could approach to these guys of the fund and Uh, make everything in make everything that we plan uh, become the reality. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing your plans. I love plans for 2022. It may seem like we're going to get out of this tunnel soon enough. For those of you, we are going to be able to check out all the different booths. Uh, so please check out the, all the community-based enterprises today uh, that have shared with us as well as all the rest of the 17 um, and then we will get back together in a bit.
Hi everyone, I hope you've enjoyed that session of getting to know our community-based enterprises. I know I personally enjoyed and learned so much from both the videos as well as the conversations. Now we are going to be taking a short break. Uh, for this break, I would really encourage you to check out both the booths um, under the Exhibitor tab in the platform as well as go to the lounge. Uh, you can see the lounge tab as well on the top uh, so that you can mingle with each other, you get to know each other. If there's any particular uh, community-based enterprises that you would like to check out, uh, this is the time for you to do so. Um, we are going to be back at 3.30 p.m. Singapore time. So that gives us about 20 minutes uh, for both, like if you need to do a bio break or you need to go to the exhibitors and the lounge uh, sections as well. So enjoy this time. I do hope you take the opportunity to get to know each other, to get to know the community-based enterprises. And also, please, please remember to rate um, the booths because we do have a People's Choice Awards uh, at the end. Um, and so as I do know that we do have a photo booth as well and that there is a notification that you can click and take on your photos and we would love to see uh, those of you who are here. So we'll catch you back in about 20 minutes uh, and have fun and uh, I'll see you soon. The WISE program started off this year with screening close to 200 applicants from the ASEAN region. It involved a very detailed and diligent review process to select our current cohort of 17 enterprises. We then interviewed our prospective skill-based volunteers and then paired them up to our enterprise's business needs. We ensure that our enterprises have the final say in choosing the volunteer because to us that's a very critical aspect, that is the power balance should be in their favour. Each engagement between the volunteer and enterprise is unique and highly customized. This makes the Angels Incubating Program unique. The next phase involved the volunteers and the Angels team working alongside the community-based enterprises to solve business challenges. New market expansion, customer data analysis, revamp of the financial process are a few of the many topics we have covered. We also interlace the program with various expert panels and workshops. The combination of customized support as well as exposure to industry insights was very helpful to our community-based enterprises. Along the way, we realized that some of the working capital of the community-based enterprises was strained due to COVID. We then decided to go and raise some of the funds to alleviate that. We were successful in raising some funds, which we then dispersed to the community-based enterprises for them to do their work. What was really commendable was that we were able to do all of this and so much more remotely and it wasn't very easy. So I'm really proud of how everybody came together, went over and beyond, showed that enthusiasm to really help our community of women enterprises. Being part of a network with other social enterprises, with other organizations and institutions that are part of the ecosystem, this is and still is amazing. And I think it's, uh, it's having a strong impact on what we do and how we do things. And we're already making changes, yes. From the initial series of workshops to the subsequent support from the team via Mighty Networks, Angels of Impact really set up the ASEAN WISE 2021 program nicely for both social enterprises and a first-time volunteers like myself. I think this program is best for the women social entrepreneurs who want to create impact on the society while you can sustain yourself. So I definitely recommended you to apply for this program. Thank you. Thank you, Angels. Bye. Thank you so much. Everyone, bye-bye. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for joining us despite everything going on here. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone. Welcome back from the break. We know that it is day one, so everyone is still learning how to use the platform. I just want to throw out there that there is an attendee deck within this session that you can download. Just scroll down a bit and you will see files and documents that you can download an attendee guideline. Also, I want to call out that there is live interpretation happening for this session. You will see a small button at the bottom of the screen that says change language. Please click on that and select your language of choice. 
For everyone that may be just tuning in, thank you again for attending the Impact for Women Sustainable Movement to End Poverty event. My name is Maddie and I am the Global Teams and Partnership Manager at Angels of Impact. It is my privilege to host today our first panel conversation. Joining us for the next hour are five guests in various positions of business leadership. First, allow me to introduce Ms. Anya Lim. Anya is the co-founder as well as the creative and managing director of Ant Hill Fabric Gallery, a social enterprise preserving traditional weaving in the Philippines. Second, we have Ms. Adenindia Arya Wisnutama, as well as Ms. Fitria Werdeningse, both of Pirkampulan Lawe, a social enterprise supporting weavers across Indonesia. Nindia is the co-founder and chairperson of Lawe, while Fitria manages the business's marketing and communications. Next, please welcome Ms. Marina Xiao. Ms. Xiao is the president and managing director of SAP Southeast Asia. In this role, her responsibilities include orchestrating the sustainable growth of SAP in the region across 4,000 employees. And she is the first woman to hold this title. Finally, allow me to introduce Dr. Sophie Suryasnia, Deputy Chair of the ASEAN Women Entrepreneurs Network, also known as AWEN. Dr. Suryasnia has decades of experience in business, banking, and accounting, and she is currently the CEO of Pension Fund in Indonesia. Welcome, all of you. So the theme for our discussion today is how do we enable women entrepreneurs in the creative economy to be successful agents of change in ending poverty? And with such expertise in business management represented here, I'd like to begin by discussing economic empowerment. Nindia and Fitria, allow me to start with both of you. We heard from your video just before that your business, Pirakampulan Lawe, preserves traditional Indonesian craft while empowering women with skills and a source of income. Nindia, perhaps can you elaborate a bit on how your work produces a means of livelihood for traditional Indonesian craft? Yeah, thank you, Mehdi. Uh, Love actually has two missions. Uh, which are conserving Indonesia's traditional hand woven and empowering Indonesian women. So we have uh, three groups of women that uh, we work closely together. First is the we first. So Lawe try to open their insights, especially how to elaborate and create new and contemporary hand woven design that meets market needs. So we also train how we first can improve their production quality. So in that way, customer understand that this special hand movement has new design with we first own new philosophy and ensure that this piece has high quality of craft craftsmanship. So we hope that uh, with those uh, efforts, we can improve their livelihood. So second groups is the women artisans. Yeah, Lawe transforms hand movement clothes into functional finished products. Lawe give trainings to women group on product diversification. And we also encourage them to find market that's suitable with their own capacity and uh, capability. Uh, for them that meet Lawe's uh, quality standard, we can invite them uh, for collaboration. And our third group is uh, Lawe's core uh, team. Uh, we develop Lawe not merely for the business, but we want to build the people. So that's why we open every opportunity and give support to our team to maximize their growth. That's our efforts, maybe. Thank you, Nindia. Fitria, may I turn this to you just to elaborate a little bit more? Because as Nindia has mentioned, and we saw from your video earlier, I've, I've learned throughout the fellowship that Pirakampula and Lawe engages in a lot of activity that supports the communities where you work, but doesn't necessarily yeah. always generate revenue. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about the activities that address poverty in these communities and don't necessarily generate revenue? How do you incorporate that into your business model? So uh, to address poverty in various community, we work uh, covers in both our business and program. In business, yes, uh, there's also about how to uh, earn the income generated from that. So by uh, the, the business addressing by giving jobs to our artisans so they can earn uh, from this. So why are we are uh, doing this more on diversifying and ready to use item uh, like bags, pouches, and all of our product, uh, product rings and do more uh, on consistency, producing the best seller of it. 
We also run Evo to initiative the channeling new market through digital marketing, initiative creating new product lines annually. But uh, so the more we sell, the more artisan can earn from this. And we, and for Lawe itself, the margin from this business, we used to run uh, the local free class for our urban poor artisan, also for teenagers in the orphanage around Jogja. That's how uh, to make product using the traditional hand woven. And this is how we address uh, poverty through our program to, as what Ninja already said, we uh, have a lot of uh, trainings for, for these women. And besides uh, our free class, uh, we also have uh, the trainings that run in a rural area. We run these uh, trainings from Sawah Lunto in West Sumatra, in Palu, Keva Menanu, also for the indigenous people in Kajang uh, and Set Panjang in West Nusa, uh, in West Kalimantan, uh, also in Lombok. Also, we uh, held this uh, training for disabled artisan in Yogyakarta. And besides this, we also run the trainings for the weaver uh, to develop the quality product and new pattern development. So we travel almost all around Indonesia uh, for this uh, for this mission for this training, so they can develop themselves and they can meet uh, the market by themselves and uh, they can learn from what we share. But this uh, these programs uh, mostly we run uh, financially support by the donors and CSR and also government agency. Uh, that's uh, from from the uh, this this is. Uh, on our uh, uh, business model, so we, we collaborate with all of these uh, stakeholders, uh, put it in a key activities and also on uh, our uh, revenue stream as the donors coming uh, to finance our program. That's Mary. Absolutely. Thank you, Fitria. Yeah, as you mentioned, this kind of work takes the collaboration of so many different stakeholders. I, I want to put that into the context of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Uh, and perhaps, Dr. Suryasni, I can turn the next question to you, because one of the key objectives of the um, framework for poverty eradication that ASEAN produced in 2016 is to include and enable poor and vulnerable groups to participate in some of these socioeconomic opportunities. Can you tell us a little bit, Dr. Suryasni, about the ASEAN Women Entrepreneurs Network and specifically how your work creates safe spaces for marginalized groups to participate. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon all. I would like to uh, <clears throat> have an uh, introduction about UN. Yeah. UN is association, that's it, uh, network yeah, for women. ASEAN. Uh, I would like to share the screen, can? No, or it's well, okay? It might be a bit small for everyone if you share the oh, screen. Okay. But what it's we can okay, do no is, I think we've uploaded your slides to this session. So if anyone is watching, okay. yeah, they can find your slides down below. Okay, okay, I see. Yeah, uh, we see it. Okay, UN is uh, ASEAN, yeah, ASEAN, uh, ASEAN Women uh, Entrepreneur Networking have uh, three, uh, I said, uh, sector for ASEAN Economic Community, ASEAN Political Security Community, and ASEAN Socio-Culture Community. And this uh, organization representative, uh, each other country, is have uh, 10 uh, countries in ASEAN uh, joining uh, in AWEN, uh, uh, like uh, Myanmar, Thailand, Malaysia, and each other. And then uh, the vision is, uh, what is it? Uh, what is it to be uh, uh, support yeah, for uh, women? And then I would like to uh, share this one about uh, how to uh, networking uh, for uh, women, yeah, because it's uh, is it, uh, each other each other business uh, should be need. Uh, how is it 
uh, networking ya yeah. and then uh, ASEAN network uh, uh, ASEAN network uh, women uh, association like uh, in Indonesia like Iwapi maybe in uh, for uh, social entrepreneur ya yeah. uh, have uh, many uh, support ya yeah, to uh, what is it uh, open the um, opening to a business social and uh, giving the what is it uh, like capacity building access to financial access to marketing access to uh, market access to uh, uh, finance yeah for financing yeah financing for uh, regarding to uh, export like this uh, something like this and then how to uh, you want to uh, support for um, a sustainability moving yeah to poverty uh, because this uh, Iran is uh, would like to support uh, to all uh, people to all women in ASEAN for uh, is it um, regarding to uh, upscale to SMAs uh, become to global go global uh, experience go global to uh, business uh, go to export something like that from before is here yeah, yeah it's just uh, should be sustainable yeah for business and then scale up after scale up is go go global it's uh yeah all uh business from zero yeah even india yeah something like this yeah uh, from zero yeah from zero that uh, then uh, is it uh then a same don't uh, hesitate yeah to uh, business yeah something like that okay thank you yeah absolutely yeah. so awen is working in multiple capacities to build up yeah. the the scalability of many of these smes yeah so maybe we can dig a little bit deeper into that because i think one of the challenges that we have um, discovered through the asean wise fellowship program is that many of the community-based enterprises in the program extend flexible working arrangements to their community partners and to the women that are both caregiving as well as working. So perhaps, Anya, I can turn this question uh, over to you. I just, I I'm thinking about the video that you shared with us earlier. Um, and I know that I've actually had the privilege of working quite closely with you throughout the WISE program, and it's been quite a joy. Um, and I see how hard you and your team work to extend those flexible work arrangements to your community partners. Can you share a little bit more about how you how you do that and perhaps some of the advantages as well as the disadvantages of this? Thank you, Maddie. I think for us, it was really inevitable because the way Anthill works is we partner with over 15 community-based enterprises across the country. So geographically, they're spread out all over the 7,101 islands. So um, it was really a desire of the artisans to be able to actually work at the comforts of their own homes. So before any of us were working from home, they were already doing it. Um, when it's always been very participatory with us and they expressed that it's important for them that before they are weavers, they are mothers first. So we wanted to honor that as well. In some communities that are larger, we do have weaving centers and some we have helped support them establish a weaving center, but most actually weave in their homes um, and use their own antique looms from their ancestors. And uh, we allow this because we want to be able to provide enabling environments that will actually support them on how they can become better mothers. Uh, some of the advantages are, I'll start probably site three. One, it, it, they feel they're able to better manage their household and they're also better able to manage their chores. Um, for some also, second is their presence in the household encourage support from their partners and their husbands because they're present in the family, their husbands appreciate them being able to add in the income, but also still be present in the household. 
Um, also, for those who have um, kids, uh, especially like in their teens or even like in their developmental years, like early on, they're already able to expose the children in weaving, right? And that's actually how um, masters and apprentices learn. They learn from observing. So from them be them working at home, children already appreciate the craft and already start to learn how to weave. Um, third also is they're able to save on costs, travel costs. They're also able to manage their own time. And it's also an advantage for mothers to be present for their family. It doesn't disrupt family dynamics. Yeah. And uh, some, some actually feel they're more productive because they're able to, to work and weave after they're done with the household. But at the same time, this is also has a lot of disadvantages. Like for one, because like, like us working from home also this past two years, there's no structure, right? Like there's a lot of distractions and interruption and the lack of structure of a nine to five work hours also affects their level of productivity. So when their productivity is low, their level of income is also low. And that inconsistency in terms of their income gives them difficulty in budgeting their finances for a month. So it also affects their their way of life or their way of living. And also a second is the standardization and quality of the output uh, also can be compromised because you don't have um, a community manager overseeing the quality of the production or the weave. And so sometimes they end up with rejects and having to redo it again. Um, there's no leadership and governance structure when you are working um, within the household, right? But the way we've set up the business model and the way we support our communities is we also have someone going around doing household visits to support these mothers at home. But these are just some of the advantages and disadvantages that a flexible work arrangement has when it comes to community-based enterprises and with artisans working from home. Thank you, Anya. Well, we're lucky then to have Ms. Rina Xiao with us here from a large corporation, SAP. Obviously, scalability is, is difficult um, for all the reasons that you mentioned, and, and one of them being that standardization is hard to come by. Perhaps, uh, Ms. Xiao, we can turn this question to you. How can a large corporation like SAP um, really offer partnerships or even purchases to community-based enterprises to help them become competitive in the global marketplace? Yeah, sure. So first of all, thank you so much to the organizers and to all the social enterprises for having us here today. SAP Enduring's mission is really to help the world run better and improve li people's lives and such a um, program, it's, it's really so important to helping us achieve our, our mission. And also for me, right, being, being from ASEAN, uh, contributing to, to the ASEAN communities that we are all part of. Um, we are really uh, committed to double down our, our efforts to, to support the communities, the local communities where we operate. And we believe such partnerships between you know, the public, the private and plural partnerships are, are, are really important to develop ASEAN economies um, and for sustainable reasons and also to drive inclusive growth. I think that's a big topic that we talk about, you know, we come across in ASEAN um, and regarding the areas that corporates like SAP can help, um, I would categorize them in three areas, right? Firstly, is around social procurement and I'll share a little bit more about this shortly. Number two is around enabling social enterprises. How do we enable them, right? In, in different skills and new skills. And third is around accelerating social enterprises, around mentoring some of this pro bono consulting that we are doing. So, so sharing a little bit on these three areas, on social procurement, SAP have actually announced um, a five by five by 25 um, initiative last year, whereby we are targeting to achieve 5% of our addressable spend with social enterprises and diverse businesses by 2025. So this will drive and promote greater inclusion of social entrepreneurship in the global economy. So for SAP perspective, this means that we could procure up to 50 million euros of our global spend to social and, and, for, and divert this social procurement at a global level. 
Um, so this would help. And, and, uh, and we are also working through with a lot of our customers that have similar initiatives that, that they're working through um, in countries across Southeast Asia. Um, we also have a, a, one of the largest, if not the largest business to business marketplace called Ariba Network, which supports nearly 3.5 trillion US dollars in transactions each year. In Southeast Asia, this would translate to approximately around 25 billion. And we are opening up this network to connect not just um, large enterprises, but those social enterprises that are corporate ready um, and, and giving them access to, to those um, um, demand um, globally. And, and every company needs, in the industry needs to procure something, right? So if we get, if we get more social enterprises to be part of that network, then that will drive inclusivity. And also that is good for, for, for economic development um, in, in overall. So we encourage everyone to look into that. Um, um, secondly, around enabling of social enterprises, um, I think as we go through this, this, this kind of a never normal circumstances with the pandemic, uh, um, um, like for example, doing this whole fellowship virtually that typically would have, we would have actually done it in, in, in person. Um, this has en enabled us to, to enhance and to partner with um, organizations like the Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs um, to promote digitization across Southeast Asia. I think moving forward, that's really important. And our industry experts have shared more with more than 50 social enterprises and accelerators on how to leverage on technology to digitize the businesses through um, the ANDE, um, Digital Learning Lab sessions. And we share case studies, best practices on how to leverage on technology. Um, and, and I love the example that Anya shared, and perhaps that's also a way technology can be a, can help to create a level playing field. Of course, we need the infrastructure to be in place as well. That's why we need that, that public, um, private and plural partnerships. Uh, and then um, leveraging on technology, while they may work from home for these waivers, they could also use it as a way to connect and network and share common challenges with, with others in, this, in similar situations and in doing the same thing. So that even, so they don't really have to, because there's only, you can't really spend a lot of time traveling to meet each other, right? There's, maybe you can do even a, um, a community event uh, once or twice a year, depending on the skill of it, but leveraging on, on something like a digital platform would enable um, them to connect um, more frequently, the, the same way as, as what we are doing here. Um, thirdly, is, um, and last but definitely not least, is, is really we believe and SAP really truly believes in, in supporting and, and, and helping to accelerate social businesses. And for, the, and, and more, for more than five years, we have actively supported more than 150 social businesses with close to 50,000 volunteering hours across ASEAN with pro bono consulting, mentorships, and partner, partnering on initiatives like ASEAN WISE. Um, and we have a program, what we call the SAP Social Sabbatical Program, which we run globally since uh, 2012, whereby um, the mentors take actually two to four weeks off um, to work with the social enterprises to solve their, their business challenges. And in fact, Angels of Impact is one of our clients this year. We're so happy about that. Um, a great example is... Uh, Javaria in Indonesia, where, where, which is focused on creating rural business opportunities for, for indigenous farmers. So as the business grew, their operational challenges also grew. And in 2016, we had three SAP colleagues who, who were assigned to look in some of the challenges that they were facing with their sales and distribution as the business grew. Um, with, offering, with, with practical recommendations, uh, and especially around supply chain and inventory management, um, the, the, my colleagues were able to provide an outside-in perspective um, and brought that level of expertise to help them resolve uh, some of the challenges they were facing. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You brought up so many good points. And yes, I have to say on behalf of the Angels of Impact team, we're really grateful that so many 
skill-based volunteers from SAP were able to support the ASEAN WISE Fellowship this year. Um, in terms of digitalization, many of our community-based enterprises have benefited from the work that the volunteers have done with them in terms of opening up new sales channels online and turning to digital outlets. So thank you again. Before we kind of move on from this section, you mentioned public-private partnerships, and that's a really key um, element here to making a, a lasting change. So I just want to turn this to Dr. Suryasnia once again. Um, if you have anything to add about how the ASEAN Women Entrepreneurs Network supports women who are in this role of both caregiving and giving responsibilities to their family and their communities, but also as workers. Yes, okay. Uh, this is uh, in ASEAN uh, ECDP yeah, with the theme of social innovation for the sustainability ASEAN uh, community, yeah, uh, support social action enterprise yeah, to the ASEAN region. Yeah, uh, for uh, the first is reducing, sorry, uh, it's noisy. Uh, could you please uh, change the is it, uh, That's okay. Clearly? We can we can hear. It's okay. It. It's okay, or we okay. can come back oh. to you. Okay. Uh, reducing poverty for improving the what's it like food yeah, of ASEAN citizens through uh, uh, job creation, employment, capacity building initiatives. Yeah, uh, and then uh, even is uh, have uh, what's it uh, many. Uh, programs for capacity building, mm. for uh, access to uh, financial initiative, for like digital uh, financial and digital marketing, and then uh, for example uh, in Indonesia for uh, going to uh, collaboration, yeah, collaboration with uh, I said uh, government collaboration with corporation, yeah, like here any SAP, yeah, uh, like uh, corporation, corporations in Indonesia uh, for uh, CSR, uh, social responsibility, to uh, offer the, uh, what is it, uh, make the capacity building uh, for women. And then uh, how to, uh, what is it, uh, women and uh, their responsibility for uh, their family, yeah, for their family to uh, what is it uh, have uh, growing on in uh, business, but the uh, family should be stable, yeah, in uh, what is it in uh, how child yeah, for uh, take care for child uh, children, right? And then this is uh, the second one is providing of improving access to quality education, yeah, capacity development of uh, programs, uh, and then rural areas, people with disability, something like that. And then, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, even uh, look like to even uh, recommends that uh, MSM uh, of informal, yeah, informal workers participate in government programs in providing uh, providing protection through the uh, insurance health insurance providing yeah prepared by the program for each other country yeah in indonesia like uh, bpjs yeah bpjs is uh, is it indonesia for uh, insurance prepare for uh, is it uh, in uh, cover yeah cover for healthy and for uh, I see it, uh, yeah, each other, yeah. And then uh, even help to provide education about the, his uh, heart uh, protection. Uh, the third is uh, providing or improving access to quality education. And then uh, I went as, uh, I said, addressing informal, yeah, informal issues related to irresponsible of exploration the nature. So, uh, this is everyone as members of the owner of the social uh, enterprise to pay attention to the uh, informant so that there is no exploration of nature. So like uh, the enterprise will uh, 
uh, the what is it like a paper yeah paper fabrication and then uh, after uh, uh, production of paper of uh, fabrication should be uh, what is it grow the plant yeah each other uh, plantation plantation again for a plant yeah okay and then uh, this is uh, yeah informal workers uh, should be participate yeah with the government programs yeah providing a protection I think that uh, should be uh, yeah if informal workers sometimes uh, don't have uh, money to uh, what is it uh, the uh, balance yeah from the business right yeah, yeah absolutely and so yeah and so. Uh, uh, each other country or each other members in A1 uh, should be to uh, support uh, for informal workers to uh, growing up the business uh, and then should have uh, balancing for uh, work-life balance and the balance for business uh, result uh, what is it uh, have uh, many uh what is it uh result yeah to life the yeah good life okay yeah thank you thank you thank you i'm glad you brought up this idea of paying attention to nature uh, that's actually where i wanted to shift this conversation next because as you know and and everyone turning in from the audience as well knows the third pillar of angels of impact is really focused on the un sdg number 12 responsible production and consumption and kind of up until this point, we've, we've talked about um, the socioeconomic prosperity of women and women entrepreneurs in ASEAN. But we also know that the future is necessarily looking at the environmental prosperity as well. So perhaps, um, Fitria, I can turn this question back to you because I know that you and your team have, have really paid attention to the environmentalism of uh, the fashion items that you produce at Laowe. Can you possibly share a little bit about how hand-woven um, fashion products are sustainable and promote sustainable business practices? Yeah, uh, so uh, very different from what our market now flood with fast fashion and that must produce and change rapidly. They have so many energy need and uh, waste left. Uh, the uh, hand-woven textile is on the, on the opposite, right? The tradition, traditional hand-woven textiles produce projects and processes from the thread spinning to the weave of the textiles not required like fossil energy or electricity because all are done manually. And it also take a long time to finish just one piece of fabric. So sometimes it even took months for uh, one piece of fabric, then that's one. And the other one is that the traditional hand woven textile uh, has a very good durability that lasts for years or even decades and everlasting pattern because you don't even have to uh, create new pattern like in every month like that. Because mostly uh, the pattern contains of story and value and all the history, right? And in in our opinion, that by promoting a product-based hand woven, we promote slow fashion. And uh, this is this is also will help the uh, the environment. And in line with that, how uh, in Laue we want to reduce the waste of production is uh, we put effort in developing design with uh, with uh, zero waste. We put effort on it, and so when we create like a big, uh, big uh, product like a bags or uh, altar like what I wear now, so the leftover of it is quite big. So we create like new design or new product. Small, uh, we use the leftover of the fabric to create smaller product like like a keychain or a small doll or uh, like a like a pattern, like a patchwork on it. So uh, we still use the leftover. This is not a waste. This is also the material. So this is resource, this is not a waste. So we still keep uh, 
uh, produce new things from uh, what left from the previous product. So, and the very last piece of uh, the smallest cut of the material, we use it for our club class uh, to introduce the traditional hand woven uh, to children in the kindergarten or, the, or in the elementary school. That's what we do in Laue. Uh, about how we use the uh, hand woven textile. Amazing. That's Mary. I love that. I love that. Thank you, Fatria, for sharing. Just yeah. to maybe contextualize this, this, the scale of this problem for, for all that are watching, I, I read an alarming statistic recently that the carbon footprint of fast fashion these days, at the rate that it's growing, is actually larger than the carbon footprint of the airline industry and the maritime shipping industry combined. So. As the audience has seen, a lot of our community-based enterprises in the ASEAN West Fellowship surround hand-woven textiles and preserving cultural traditions, and we really see this as such an important kind of cornerstone um, of this socioeconomic empowerment as well as the environmental protection going into the future. Perhaps before um, we move on from Laue, in India, can, can I just ask you, because Fitria touched on kind of how long it takes to produce some of these um, hand-woven products. What are some of the challenges that you see in scaling hand-woven traditions? Yeah, quite a lot of challenges that we meet in how we're scaling sustainable production of handmade industry. Uh, specifically for hand-woven, uh, we in Laue, we, we, we see that we need to find specific market. So the needs market that put long-term and sustain order because we cannot compete in mainstream market, right? And second, from production point of view, uh, we need to provide sustainable production of natural fiber and natural dye. Uh, when the demand rise, we cannot harvest the whole natural fiber and natural dye plant. So we need to prepare the replanting and uh, of course it needs more time versus the main meat fiber and dye. And the third thing is that hand woven production nowadays uh, also really depend on the weavers regeneration. As we all know, majority traditional weavers in Indonesia and I think also in Asia are seniors weavers. So prob probably if uh, we can have innovation like uh, uh, an international, uh, traditional hand woven tools that easily operated, it can attract it can attract more youngsters to learn how to weave. And hopefully it can boost to popularize woven as uh, hand woven as doable work. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and, uh, that this hand woven has low carbon footprint. So combined with sustainable natural fiber and natural dye planting, hopefully it can attract young generation to involve in this work. That's made you from me. Thank you, Nindya. Thank you so much. Okay, so we've talked a lot about scalability, about environmental advocacy in the, both the businesses, Antil and Perkampu and Laue. Ms. Xiao, you talked earlier about digitalization and the power of technology. And of course, we have, as mentioned before, several SAP volunteers as part of the program. But we also recognize that there can be a significant digital divide um, between, let's say, what some of the skill-based volunteers in SAP can provide and, and kind of what the infrastructure allows for in some of these areas where our community-based enterprises are based. So I'm wondering from your perspective at SAP or even for other larger corporations, what can you or they learn from community-based enterprises, um, specifically those that are in the creative economy? Oh, that's a really good question, and, and I can think of three areas where 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 you know we, we can um or large corporations like SAP um can can learn from. Um, first is is really to understand the 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 impact um of of social enterprises on on the communities that we are all part of, and to be more purpose driven, right? You know, we we have learned that many many employees when they join SAP or any other organization, it's not just to earn a living, you know, and, and, you know, um, and have work, but it's really more important these days. We find more and more employees looking for meaningful work. So when we take part in a, a program such as what we have here with WISE, 
this enables SAP and our employees um, to really contribute, to be more purpose-driven. And that's really important to also um, to understand what is it like in a very different perspective. So that allows us, I think that has great, great um, um, contribution and, and, um, and also improve our understanding and, and also connect with the local communities that we are part of. Um, and like I mentioned earlier at SAP, our purpose is to help the world run better and improve people's lives. And, and, this, is, and this is something that um, really um, enables us to act on it. Um, secondly, um, we have heard so many wonderful stories of how um, relationships have been built between the SAP mentors and the social enterprises through pro bono work. Um, and these relationships quite often last beyond the, the fellowship or the program that is in place. Um, I'd like to share some feedback we have from uh, one of the co-founders of um, Kasuma Indonesia that left a, a really um, glowing testimonial for, for her wise mentor, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, May, um, and shared that you know, her extensive knowledge and, and research provides input in, a, in a, both a friendly and engaging way for, for, the, for their business. And they really enjoy discussing it and you know, also as if they are discussing with friends. So I think that has value both ways. And the mentorship is also a, a two-way relationship. So, so that is a fulfilling and valuable experience, both for the social enterprises as well as for the SAP mentors. Um, third is that, um, and this is really important, that you know, in SAP, we typically in our usual work environment, we deal with similarly large enterprise, right? Even the smaller enterprises come with certain infrastructure in place already. However, um, when we engage with social enterprises, this allows our employees uh, to take the skills that they have learned, they have gained over years, and think about how they apply it in, uh, in the social enterprises that, that they work with. They are more in a rural setting, like the rural artisans, for example. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, this also enables them to, to refine and the skills and be more adaptable to different environments. And that I think has huge benefit to SAP employees. Absolutely, thank you. That transferability has been really key um, throughout. Yeah, in fact, I see Anya nodding uh, because I, I've had the privilege of working with Anya and another SAP volunteer, Allison. Hi, Allison, if you're watching online. Uh, every week for the past seven months or so, and it, has absolutely been like you said it's a, it's a call between friends almost and we've learned so much from one another so maybe anya i can turn this last question over to you because i'm mindful of our time um and i remember when we were on a call recently you and i were going through your spreadsheet of impact metrics and we were looking at that maybe with allison at 1.2 and i recall that Ant Hill Fabric Gallery has upcycled nearly 6,000 kilos of fabric to date. Can you talk a little bit about your upcycling program? This was something that Nindya and Fitria mentioned as well. Um, and just kind of how you were able to make that possible at Ant Hill. Yes, thank you, Maddie. Um, our, our, our reason for also being mindful of the way we impact the environment is very similar to Fitria's reflection and insights. We value so much the process that goes behind weaving. Our ancestors considered our fabrics our second skin. And so every thread really has a significant value and represents our identity and our story as Filipinos, right? So through the years, we have been very mindful of the waste and the off cuts and end cuts from production that we accumulate. And then I think it was around 2016, we realized we had sacks and sacks of scrap fabrics from production. And we were starting to think and brainstorm on how else we can upcycle and add value to these scraps in a, in a bigger way, in a, in, a, in a way where we can actually scale it, right? Because we can come up with those small products, but um, we don't know like its functionality. And so we were very fortunate to have had a textile designer collaborate and co-design with one of our weaving partners here in Cebu. 
to experiment on how they can actually use scrap fabrics like from your t-shirts old clothes and how we can incorporate them into our weaves and create a new fabric so from there that was actually the birth of our circularity programs we then um, experimented on weaving what we call our zero waste fabrics. So basically, these are your old clothes and, and old scrap fabrics. We cut them into strips and we use them as supplementary weft and weave them into a new fabric. In fact, a huge um, retail brand in the Philippines was very drawn to the work that we do and really appreciated the environmental impact um, plus the economic and cultural impact that we create with our partner. So they ship tons and tons of textile waste that could have been in a dump site. And we were able to upcycle them into new fabrics. And then from those fabrics, they launched a new clothing line. So we're able to extend the life cycle of these fabrics, of these weaves. They're not made of natural fiber, but in the process of extending the life cycle, we're still able to create an impact in the environment. So that's one. Apart from that, we also look at um, consumption, right? Responsible production and consumption as part of the UNDG goals. And we see our community of customers you know, being very supportive of the designs of the clothes that we carry. So they own several skirts, several blouses, and their and their closets are full of our, of anthill designs. But then later on down the line, you either outgrow the design or you gain weight, you lose weight. And what do you do with those um, clothes, right? So um, from that insight, we launched what we call a weave exchange program where our customers can actually return their old old clothes in exchange, we evaluate it and we give them a gift card that they can give to friends or they can use also to purchase a new design. Um, lastly, because of the old clothes that we get from our customers, we launched what we call our reweave line. It's our pre-loved line, but we call it our always loved line where customers can purchase our designs and our weaves at a more accessible price. We have young um, customers like students. I mean, obviously it's not it's not very cheap. I mean, we we value and advocate for a fair wage. So our our um, the prices of our fabrics sometimes are not accessible to students, but we want to gain we wearers from them. And so this always love line or this reweave line makes it accessible for customers to a wider to to actually reach a wider market, to access a wider market. So these three programs are very replicable um, and they truly, truly allow us to be able to educate the consumers, to be mindful of consumption and to find ways how to add value and upcycle and extend the life of their clothes and of their fabrics. I love that. Thank you, Anya. And I see you're, you're wearing one of your products right now aren't you yes it looks lovely yes i am <laughs> proudly wearing one of our weaves this is a traditional filipiniana blouse with a butterfly sleeve thanks maddie lovely all right i am mindful of time so i want to transition us to um, a question and answer session we have received uh, a couple of questions from the audience so let's let's take one and see if we have time for another this question is for miss xiao how can social enterprises like the ones in the WISE Fellowship take advantage of SAP social procurement plans? Um, if, yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, I would suggest to reach out to your mentor um, to discuss more about it um, and ensure that you, you get yourself ready um, and, and enroll in the SAP Ariba network that I just mentioned. Okay. And maybe as a follow-up that, to that, would handmade products be relevant for SAP social procurement plans? I would, I would, I would say uh, all products should be relevant in some way or fashion. So I would say that yes, definitely. Wonderful. All right. Would any of you like any final words before we close? I, I want to be mindful that we're shifting into our next session. Don't be shy. I would just like to say thank you so much for having us as part of the program. It is our pleasure and we are really grateful to be able to contribute and work with all the social enterprises as part of it. We, looking, we are looking forward 
to doing more together. So thank you so much. Um, and appreciate all the feedback and, and stories. Thank you. Thank you very much. Likewise. All right, if there are no further questions, uh, for those of you that are tuning in, please do feel free to keep dropping questions into the Q&A and we'll be able to answer them on the platform. Um, before we go to the next session, I just want to introduce that we'll be playing a video by the ASEAN Women Entrepreneurs Network so you can learn a little bit more about the work of Dr. Suryasnia as well. See you on the other side. Hello everyone, thank you so much Medi for moderating such an insightful panel. I think there were several things that really came to me uh, during that session. Uh, first of all was really how whenever we enable women and indigenous peoples led community enterprises, it's really not just about enabling them per se, but also all of the ecosystems um, and the ripple effects that they have across you know, their communities, um, their, their, their artisans, but also the, the, the environment. And you know, so it, it kind of feels like it, it feels good to support them and enable them out of poverty while also knowing that there's a much more holistic impact out of it. And the second thing that really came out for me in that panel was how each of us can play a role uh, in this work uh, of enablement and things like that, um, you know, as whether or not we're a community-based enterprise or we're someone in the big corporations, uh, or even if you're a layperson, right, whether your fashion choices, your consumption choices, each of us definitely have a role to play. And so I hope, you know, you found the panel insightful and you found some learnings along the way, uh, just like I did. So with that, you know, I'm very excited to present the next section. We have a very special segment. Um, and first of all, let's enjoy this presentation by Here and Found. So Here and Found is like the feeling that when you listen to something deeply, and then you found something or discover something unexpectedly and meaningful. Hi, my name is May. I'm the CEO of Hien Found. Hi, my name is Drax, CMO and co-founder of Hien Found. About 10% of Thai population are indigenous people. However, 
the lack of understanding and awareness about indigenous culture leads to the various forms of discrimination, such as the lack of access um, in education and opportunities, as well as um, the prejudice among peers. So Hien Fao seeks to revive the indigenous culture and wisdom, and also we promote understanding about the indigenous people with the common language, music. We visit the indigenous villages to work closely with the indigenous musicians and performers in order to record their music and the sound of the village of the people. We curate music events called World Music Series, where we bring the indigenous musicians to Bangkok and let the people in Bangkok and foreigners to have a chance to listen to their songs and their stories. And we also have the online platform, which is called um, Local Online Stock Music. So people from around the world can listen to learn about this through online. We work with around 30 musicians um, around Thailand. When we work with the indigenous musicians, we let them design which songs they want people to listen to. We usually like consult and educate them about how they can take care of the ownership. And make yeah. sure that they know their rights. Yeah. yeah. We work as a music publisher, so the musician gets 50% of the profit. And then when we work on the music event together, they gain like fixed rate as other professional musicians. And also every song or every music record that we put it on the website, they own the copyright. We think that music is a common language. So exploring new kind of music, especially indigenous music, it's like you exploring the world. And this will take you through beyond the horizon of the sound. And it can also be your inspiration and you can learn other cultures through the music as well. The indigenous voices have been taken from us for a long time. So now it's time to listen. So please check out our website or the social media and you will get into the indigenous music world. Thank you. From here in Found, let's welcome Sirasar Bummar. Hi Sirasar. What support does your community of artisans need most in 2022? Okay. Thank you so much for the question. Um, as we work with the indigenous musicians and performers around Thailand for more than five years, um, we say that in 2022, it would be nice for everyone to, to listen to their voice, listen to their music, to learn more about the indigenous people and their way of life. This will be the big support for them because they need your understanding. Also, moreover, in terms of um, practical support, you can support us to work with more indigenous musicians because we record their music and their songs and, uh, and turn it into a digital content. And by doing this, um, not only the indigenous people can express their voice worldwide, but also other people, other groups of people have more opportunity to access to their local wisdom, their music and everything to get inspired as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing how, you know, the, how we can actually share the inspiration. You know, and speaking of actually listening uh, to some of here in France's own indigenous artists, we actually have one with us today, Kaya Lore of the Karen Tribe. Kaya is a popular musician, uh, and an entrepreneur, and a champion of environmental preservation. So I'm very glad uh, to call upon Kaya Lore. Please come on stage. <music>
How soothing was that? Now, here's a little fun fact. That piece was actually commissioned for this particular Impactful Woman event. So that's an original. It's the first time anyone has heard it. So you got to hear it first. So thank you so much, Kaya, um, and Here and Found as well. So I'm coming you know, to quite a sad part of the day where we are going to be wrapping up. However, you know, we are going to be opening up the lounge. I know like earlier we had a little break where, you know, we probably didn't actually know what was happening on the platforms. So I just want to call out to you that on the top panel of your screen, there are several options, right? So you had the conference hall, there is the exhibitors, there's also the lounge section. So we're going to be opening up the lounge because we do want you to be interacting with each other as well as the uh, community-based enterprises. So when you go and click on the lounge tab, you will see sofas, right? I mean, you will see like descriptions or like pictures of sofa. And you can look at for an open uh, spot on one of the sofas and you can double click and that is how you'll be prompted to join that particular networking um, group. 
Okay, so we are going to be opening it up um, for some time. So please do take the time to actually get to know each other, interact with each other, uh, and actually just you know exchange your learnings, exchange what are some of the things that you're going to be excited for tomorrow. Um, and another thing as well is I do want to call out. Please do check out um, the community-based enterprises booths as well. That's under the exhibitor uh, tab. And then please rate uh, the booths because we do have a People's Choice Award that we will be announcing announcing tomorrow okay so it has been an absolute pleasure to be hosting this session for all of you today I'm very much looking forward to tomorrow um, the lounge is going to be open up at 8 a.m. tomorrow Singapore time so please feel free and come and mingle and actually get to know each other a bit more and in the meantime have a beautiful rest of the day and I'll see you tomorrow thank you so much I do am I am looking forward to meeting you at the lounge. Uh, so once again, you can go scroll to the top of your tab. You will see the lounge option. Click on that. There's going to be sofas. Click a spot on one of the sofas. Double click it, and then you will be able to join the groups as well as the social uh, or the community-based entrepreneurs uh, in the in the lounge as well. So please don't just leave us. Come and hang out with us for a bit, uh, and I will see you on that side. Yeah.